call is now being recorded. Yo, yo. Yo. What's good? Shit, man. Chilling, trying to uh, escape the Oklahoma heat. Oh, it's hot down there. Yeah, man. It's uh, it's pretty much been in the 90s for the past three days. Man, it's been kind of cold up here a little bit. We've gone everywhere from, like, almost 90 to, like, 60-something and all that. But you know what the what one of the best things to do when you're trying to escape the heat is? What's that? It's to chill in the crib, crank up the AC, and listen to an audio book. And... Mm. And you can do that. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial for more audiobook downloads at audibletrial.com slash channel 10. And if you do that, you have over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, your Android device, your Kindle, or your MP3 player. Mm, that's what's up. That is what's up. So make sure you check out audibletrial.com slash channel 10 and sign up and beat the heat and the cold and whatever other weather situation that this global warming has you in. Feeling this here. Yeah, son, you feel it, man. Roll up, son. You gotta just do it, yeah, yo. Man. Yo, roll up, man. It's a different again. channel, son. Roll up, on, man. Roll up, watch the channel, son. Different plane now, man. It's all good. Roll up, all good, baby, in every hood, Bridge. son. Roll up, yo. Yeah. CNN, Network, Channel 10. It's on again. Network Street Network niggas, it's grown man. men. Bold face, get in your up. face. Stay in place, yo. Crime lace. Cast more beef than Scarface. Oh, CNN, Network. 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 Channel 10, it's on again. Street niggas, this grown man. Bold face, get in your face. This call is now being recorded. But anyway, what's good with you, man? <laughs> Shit, man. Um, I've been, you know, kind of, kind of, sort of making moves, you know, between sending demos out and moving around in uh, the the Norman music scene, That's the indie up. scene, whatever like that. How is that working out for you? Um, it's working out pretty well. Um, I went to uh, went to the to the uh, the dope chapel here, which is um kind of like I guess like an art an arts collective an arts collective. So they do different things there. Um, they have like certain days where they just like um they uh, they show art, have like art showcases for like paintings and drawings and whatnot. And then a lot of times they have music. Um, so like a lot of local bands that come and play, perform, and they have some bands that come out um, from like the surrounding area. So a lot of people from Texas come down or come come up rather. And um, they had this one band there that I think that like I'm assuming they were like the main band. They came from Austin, Texas, and they were actually on tour. Um, and then they had about I think three other three other bands um, there. But it's like a super like it's really small like a super hip street place. And the acoustics of like the it's like a it's like a little small building it's like a house or something like that, mm-hmm. um, and it's like the you know like the it's, it's not made for like live recording like you know for live music and so like when these amps and you know these flashing guitars you know we're talking about kind of like a cross between punk rock and like some, some shoegaze um, from what I've seen so far and. um it, it it just pierces your ears, man. It's, it's it's not really all that good. It's not good for you, I'm assuming. And um, I can only imagine how it is in the winter time when they had the doors closed. Oh man. Um. Now bouncing off. Yeah, and um, because I know like um the the main band that came from from Texas, uh, their shit was just way too loud. And um, one of the band members were, they were, she was complaining to the other one who also played guitar that her shit was just too loud, and she turned it down. But I don't know if she was high or what, but she liked the sound. And I know that I eventually I, I had to go outside um, because it was it was just too much. And it was funny too because um, 
it was like really like stereotypical, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, you like you're in this history place, and like this type of band that comes up, and they're the type of band that like the lead singer, they'll tell you what the song is about, and so the first song is like, she was like. This song is about getting fucked up, and then they just go like just slashing, you know, just hitting the guitars real hard, and you don't you you understand what they're saying because the, the guitars too loud. And then the second one, and this is like super stereotypical. This song is about killing yourself. <laughs> so you, you get the point. But eventually, um, I talked to to one of the band to uh, one of the band members of a local band there, and he's like, oh, this really cool dude. Um, he did, um, he was doing drums for the band, and he, um, he had an MPC as well, and he was playing, like, some house music, um, too, and we kind of clicked, because, um, I was kind of, uh, I got into a conversation with, with who, what happened to be his girlfriend, and she was telling me more about him, and how, how deep he is in the music and whatnot, and, uh, so, um, we, we kind of clicked a little bit, he told me, because I asked him about the MPC, and eventually that led to some other things, and um, I gave him, like, um, one of the demos um, from way back when that I actually made for Canada that Bun B was supposed to, to, to receive. Um, I gave him that one, and uh, he hit me back the, um, the next day saying he liked it, so he wants to collab with me. And we're trying to, uh, you know, schedule a day where we just sit around and make some shit. Um, What's up? Do you know... Um what his uh, recording setup is like? Man, I have no idea. All I know is that he has an MPC, he has drums, and um, he uses, you know, Reason and Reaper, and I, I can only imagine. Um, but I do know that he that, that they do have, like, a studio. He told me that, that they have a studio, and they're trying to, like, to, um, like, to get it, like, fully up and running. Mm-hmm. And... He told me he he told me like straight up he said that if um if I wanted like to to like to re-record my album properly um he said that I I can do it there at like a at a discount um but then if I just like to lab with him that's that's just you know that's free um yeah um I I think I think he has like I think he has like mixing boards too I think I asked him that I can't. Exactly remember, um, but there was this also this one other guy. He runs like um, a cassette label um, that he kind of like, like him and his friends they run it. And I was talking to him about it. And he's like one of the people who um, his band took me home. So I was riding with. Uh, um, well, how it started was I was outside talking to like the other dude, we were talking about VSPs and uh, Reason and Fruity Loops and. This guy really likes VSTs, apparently. So he heard the he heard the term VST, and he comes over and he just gets really excited. He's like he's proud to be yelling at us about you know the VSTs that he just loves. He thinks everyone should like be on. And after that, um, I told him I was about to leave because um, I had another ride home, and he said, uh, and he he told me he said, well you know you're a cool dude, you know about VSTs, you know, um, I want you to listen to my band. That's right, because I keep getting that. I never told you, like, the whole, the whole story anyway. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm looking at him, I'm like, man, I don't know, man. But he's like, please, man, please listen to my band. This is, like, one of our first times uh, performing. I'm like, all right, cool. All right, man, thanks, man. I'll be sure to give you a ride home. Just remind me. <laughs> I'm like, all right, all right. Um, so eventually we go and listen to his band. He, he gives me, like, some beer. Because, like, the way it works there is that... Um, it's all BYOB, and they have, like, this thing, like, this refrigerator in the back, so people just bring in, like, these 30 packs of all different types of beer, and they just go back and forth getting beer and shit like that, and then they go outside and smoke in between bands and whatnot. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah, because, um, like, the, the, the person who runs it, um, I asked her if, like, the beer was free, and then she explained, she, she explained to me how it works. And so she told me, essentially, that if I go in there and take a beer... You know, it's pretty much not the right thing to do, but, you know, if I do it, no one will probably care. Mm. So, I pretty, so I pretty much got, so what I got out of that pretty much was like, not, don't take any beer if you don't know anyone. Yeah. Uh, but eventually I got, I got hooked up with beer. Um, and anyway, like this guy, the guy whose band he wanted me to listen to, 
um, they're going on tour. Um, they're like they're preparing to go on tour. So they're so from here, I think within like two weeks, they're going to like Texas, Missouri. Uh, I don't know. Some, some, and they go other places too, but eventually they they want to find themselves in Florida performing, and then they're, they're coming back to Oklahoma. Um, and then so he asked me if I wanted to be on, um, if I wanted like to to to, to come out with the cassette. I'm on a label. I said, hell yeah. Mm. And uh, he said, all right, cool. And then I, I gave him, like, the, I only had two demos with me. And so I gave him the other demo that I took with me to Canada. And um, it was just really weird because um, it was me, two of, like, two of the other band members. But I think one of the other band members, he went in another car, and they had this other black girl there. And she was, like, just drunk in the back, just, just, just fucked up. <laughs> just riding along. And um, he got really excited when he found out I was from Baltimore, so he wanted to talk about the riots and uh, what happened and about racial equality. And and um, and uh, he was telling me about his friend. One of his friends, she goes to Micah, and she does like some type of fashion show. She does fashion shows down there somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I think he was telling me that she's like a part of some type of arts collective, and I wasn't entirely sure if he was talking about Wham City or not. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so um, all I know is that you know, yeah. So he dropped me off. He told me that he'll be in touch because I put my email like on the CD, and um, uh, he put the, he put the CD um, straight into like straight into like the CD player, and they drove off to the intro to my album. I'm not wow. sure if that was just for show or not, but. Uh, I guess we'll find out. Oh yeah, and then um finally, um of course there was this one black guy there, right? Mm-hmm. And he just came up to me, he's like my man. And then he gives me a debt, but there's like a certain way he like he twists his hand to give me the debt. And then so I'm looking at him. I said, I said, uh, you do music? He like, man, how you know, man? I'm like, I said the way you gave me this debt. I said, I know you do hip hop. Yep. Man, I do I do some shit, man. I'm like, you freestyle, don't you? He's like, man. I said, all right. He's like, you want me to freestyle for you? I'm like, all right, go. So he freestyles like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> was it good? I mean, yeah. I mean, he yeah, he wasn't bad. I mean, but you know, he was like kind of drunk, and he um and he was like really freestyling, so he would like kind of stumble a little bit, and then like if he saw something, he was just like, you know, how, how you would do it back in the day. Yeah. And yeah, so he was like rapping about someone's shoes or like the like the sidewalk and how it looks, so shit like that. It wasn't bad. Um, and he stopped. And he said, "All right, my man gave me the same debt," and he just walked off. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So he said he was like, "Man, I'm sure I'm going to see you around somewhere. I don't know where, but I'm gonna see you." I'm like, "I'm sure I'll see you," and that was it. So yeah, pretty much in a nutshell, that was my. My time at the Dope Capital that one night. Way better than the last time. How do you feel about um, embedding yourself into the into the native uh, Oklahoma music scene? Um, I mean, I think I mean I think I feel I'm okay with it. Um, you know, it's different from the uh, I guess the. The Baltimore scene, this was like the 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 part that we know, the hip hop scene, right. and you know um, the Norman scene. Anyway, I mean, although the Norman it does have a hip hop scene, mm-hmm. or Oklahoma, but like I don't like the the scene is really in Oklahoma City, from what I'm understanding, because they have like a you know they have like a double cup culture and lean and shit all in Oklahoma City, mm-hmm. and they sound like they're from the south, but um, which I guess they technically are, but here. It's like super indie, so you either do like some type of like country music or like red dirt country was what they call it here, mm. and um, or you do some type of you know weird stuff that you would see on Pitchfork. Um, so I mean, I think I, I mean I think I fit in. Apparently, people that I listen, listen to to my stuff, they like it. Um, and you know, with like you know, uh, coming out with this demo and sending you know sending it around. I'm pretty much sending it to these type of indie labels that cater to this type of music that goes on here. So, um, I mean, I feel like I can be a part of it. I don't know what capacity. I don't know about performing and stuff like that, but 
I don't know if I have enough time to do it because a lot of people here, they're on um, their undergrads. And so it's kind of weird being around it and, you know, um, I know at least like the band member's girlfriend, I'm like seven years older than her. And, and, and you know, what's crazy is, you know, I guess, you know, getting older, it's like, you know, we've, we've gone through that type of local music scene type of thing before. So like, do you feel like you kind of have the advantage because you kind of know how things work coming from, you know, a larger market being Baltimore and all that? Like, I guess, like, like do you feel kind of like a seasoned veteran almost? I mean, I, I think kind of in a way because, um, but then the thing is, like, I think the way I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure if it's just me being, you know, I guess like the arrogance that comes with, like, doing music. And you know you're kind of supposed to you're supposed to feel that you know that you're that you're really good and possibly better than someone else I guess in a way, or well, at least in the hip hop sense. And um, like even like the way like the guy who who I'm going to be collaborating with like the way he was talking to me, mm-hmm. it was kind of as if he didn't really expect me to know certain things. But um, thing is though, a lot of people they don't they they think I'm they think I'm their age though when they when they talk to me and I don't think I really told him what you know that I'm a graduate student or whatever like that. And so I imagine that he was probably pretty surprised um, when he when he heard the demo and stuff like that. But you know, I, I never I didn't really talk to him in depth about you know what I've done. And so I guess to him, since he's never seen me around, he probably just thought that it's my first time around this type of you know this type of this type of environment and stuff like that. But he did seem like a bit more interested that I told him that you know I was like sending shit to labels. Because yeah. I think he thinks... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it's funny when you meet somebody who, like, kind of has their little thing on lock, and they're kind of like the master of their domain. And so, you know, how, however they address, you know, I guess the people who they may consider to be, like, the little people who are under them or beneath them or who don't know as much as they know. And then when you come and you start, you know, dropping you know, the stuff that you're doing and the stuff that you know about is kind of like, you know, you can kind of almost see the look on their face like it hits them, like, oh, like, this dude is official. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in a way, yeah. I mean, but the thing, I mean, like, he was, he was getting more into, like, I guess, like, um, uh, like, you know, like more physical equipment, like, you know, NPCs and stuff, and, you know, I don't know much, I don't know a lot about NPCs, yeah. uh, all like that. But then I told him, I said, I just I work on free loops and Adobe Audition, really. That's, that's really about it at this point. And, like, the way he was, like, uh, he said, well, you know, you know, if that's what you do, then you're good at it, then just keep on doing that. But the way he said it was, like, oh, well, he probably doesn't, he doesn't really, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, yeah, kind of yeah, like, like, yeah. like, 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 it's like the stigma that's attached to it before somebody hears what you may come out of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because, um, yeah, because, like, people, they weren't really interested in, in, in me saying free loops because then, because usually when you, when you're, like, around these type of people, these types of people who, who are playing guitars and other things, they, they at least want to hear you say reason and not free loops a lot of times. Because a lot, because, like, when I, when I mentioned, like, free loops, they said, um, well, do you use reason? And I'm like, uh, I have, but I'm not really, in- I'm not really interested in reason. And then, you know, they go into like four and stuff like that, which I'm totally cool with, but, you know, I don't know, maybe I haven't played with reason enough to really, uh, um, to really start liking it. I mean, it has its advantages to me, you know, from, you know, when I used it, um, <clears throat> it's great to me for, when you have a keyboard hooked up and you're trying to get an idea down without too much work, because, like, Reason, it has wonderful sound banks and stuff that you can get for it, and the sounds just sound great, where, as, and, you know, it's, like, proprietary, so you can only use that for a reason, whereas for your loops, you might have to do a little bit of extra work and stuff to get the good sounds and make it come out right, but at the end of the day, it, as long as you have a program that can do certain things, um, you know, you can make it come out great, and you can't really tell what somebody used unless you know you know a a particular sound that they're using or something like that. But 
Yeah, that whole, I don't know, I figure, I, like, I always figure, especially with the advances, and, and, and like, I don't even say Free Loops anymore, I say FL Studio, but, <laughs> like, you know, with the advances in, I guess, software, and every different type of software, you know, I kind of figure that by now, that whole elitism, when it comes to what type of software you use, I probably would have figured that would have faded by now. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, you would think that, but, um, I mean, at least for my being there, because, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's a, there's, it's a, it's a bit different, you know, when you're like, um, I guess more or less in the, in the hip hop scene, at least a, a bit more different, because when you're in the hip hop scene, it's strictly more, like, it's, it's strictly, like, just beats. It's not, it's not, um, there aren't, like, a lot of people or as many, um, doing, like, a lot of in- instrumentation. Mm. Compared to, like, you know, a lot of indie people who do, like, different things, you know, they may bang on the NPC, but they can actually play a guitar, too, if they really felt like it. Yeah. Um, and so I think it probably didn't help my cause when, you know, I say, well, yeah, I don't play on, instrument, on any instruments. I just, you know, do what I do. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so I mean, it, it, I mean, it was an interesting. I think it was my first time being in this type, in that type of atmosphere by myself. Mm. Well, I mean, or maybe just in general, I mean, for real. But um, I mean, I learned a lot. Like, I mean, I got to. I think I, I think I understand the city more. You know, like um, you know, I think on episode two, when I you know I was telling you about Canada and Winnipeg and stuff like that, and you know I said that. You know, the main thing I want to hear is, you know, like, I want to go to YouTube to a bar somewhere, like, in my area, and then some type of music, play, like, some type of music scene there, so I can really understand how the city is. Yeah. And so I think within that one night, I think I got, like, a, I have a whole totally uh, different um, understanding of the city that, I, that I'm living in right now. That's so good. So, um, do you think you'll um, be frequenting that place again, or you know that particular event or, or whatever they had going on? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I think I, I told you about like, you know, like the first time I went in there, which was literally only for like you know two minutes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, thinking about it, maybe it wasn't the best thing for me to do, like the way I the way I handled it, but. Um, it just, I mean, like, the, the way the beats were being made, it just, it just didn't seem right. And I, I just couldn't stand up there and take that for real. But, um, if there's, I mean, well, maybe I'll try to go back again, maybe if there's a hip hop thing, but if there's a rock thing, I would most likely like to go back to it if I have enough time. That's what's up. I, I don't know, one thing that I find about, you know, getting embedded in another place's hip hop scene is that you kind of become part of that scene to the point where people identify you with that scene. So, like, you know, when I was on a whole lot of shows and stuff, I would come out to certain places and they would peg me as the DC rapper. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, I would have to correct people and be like, no, nah, I'm from Baltimore. And it. it, it and then it got to be kind of weird because, you know, I was raised in Baltimore. But, true, I was born in D.C. and I went to college in D.C. And I'm out here in D.C. doing my thing. But I was doing my thing in Baltimore, you know, before that. And I'm still kind of going back and forth doing them at the same time, you know. So, um, and then it's weird, too, because, like, when I was in D.C., um, I used to go to this super hood spot every Wednesday and perform. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I mean, this shit was so ridiculous. And, um, you know, in D.C., a lot of people have a certain feeling towards people who go to Howard. So the DJ, her name was DJ Sexy Spice. <laughs> and she, I remember one time I got up on that stage, and she said, from Howard University, articulate. And then, like, everybody kind of, you know, like, how when you how when you're in, like, a local hip-hop scene, pretty much the whole audience is all rappers. Yeah. And if you're not part of their crew or something like that, or they don't know you like that, they're just going to walk away. Yeah. But then, you know, if they like you, if, like, one dude starts to actually admit that he likes you, he'll come up and then he'll kind of chastise the other people 
for, you know, being rude to you. So that's kind of like what used to happen. And then, you know, a lot of the dudes in D.C., they start messing with me or whatever, musically. So, um, I don't know. It's like a weird thing. So, like, if you start doing shows and stuff like that, like, how are you going to feel, um, like, like, you know, like you've been there for a minute now, and it's like, you know, as you embed yourself into that scene more, how are you going to feel being known as, like, possibly as an Oklahoma artist? Um, or had you, like, even thought of that? Because <laughs> that's, that's what's going to happen, like, you know, it's going to be from Norman, Oklahoma. I mean, well, I think you, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it would be annoying, but, um, I can see, I mean, for, for, for two reasons, I can see it kind of being a good thing on my part. Um, because, like, first of all, we know, like, the, the stigma that Baltimore just has overall when it comes to music. Right. And how, you know, different Baltimorean musicians, they kind of have a curse. Although I think it's kind of being lifted, at least from the perspective of the indie scene, where you have, like, you know, people like Dan Deacon, um, and Beach House, and of course Animal Collective, which people kind of equate to the Beach Boys to a certain extent. Um, you, you, you have that. And then also, um, being labeled as an Oklahoman, you know, um, I'm in mean Norman, so, um, the, the Flaming Lips, they're, they're from Oklahoma City, I believe. I think it's Oklahoma City. And so maybe if, let's say, if I am, you know, I'm seeing it like coming out from the Norman indie scene, maybe people would think of the Flaming Lips, yeah. which can, which can maybe help me in the long run. Um, so I don't think I would, I would mind it overall, I don't think. And then you can flip it on some old black town type shit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm talking about Lang- Langston and, you know, and, and stuff like that, yeah. Um, cause also, you know, like, um, when it comes to the, like, the, uh, the, the letters that I've been sending out to, to like, to, uh, to demos, with my, with my demos at least, um, you know, I don't mention anything about Baltimore, so they just, well, in certain ones I do. It's just like a Baltimore based label than I do, of course, but, um, other than that, no, it's just about me and my music and, you know, uh, the return address is from Norman, Oklahoma, and that's all they know. So, so, like, do you feel, um, I guess, even though, you know, sometimes it can come with a stigma, do you feel that, uh, that sense of Baltimore pride to where you have to rep it or like you feel like the urge to rep it sometimes? Um, I mean, well, the thing is, I mean, it kind of always comes to me like people ask me where I'm from. And of course I'm going to say Baltimore. So I don't know. I mean, cause it's weird because people, they had, I mean, it's just something about Baltimore. People are just amazed, like fascinated by it. And the wire didn't help. And especially with, like, the riots. I mean, you just had, like, riots, the wire, and then it's Baltimore, and, like, in, in its history of just being seen as, like, this weird this weird city anyway, way before that, you know, way, way before the wire and everything else, you know, through songs that Nina Simone and and um, other people have made about it. Um, so usually I wait, I wait until, I wait until people, you know, ask me where I'm from, because obviously I'm not from here. I think that's pretty obvious. <laughs> um, I guess, um, you know, in my travels, and, like, especially in hip-hop, like, and, you know, going back and forth to New York a whole lot and then being in D.C. a whole lot and just being around, you know, a lot of New York people, it's like, you know, when you, I don't know, like, I always felt like this weird sense of pride or whatever because when you say you're from Baltimore, it's like, people look at you different, like, yo, 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 like, you're not supposed to be here right now. <laughs> like, you know, how did you do this, or how did you do that, or how did you get here? Even if you were in Baltimore, like, you know, they see certain things, and they're like, yo, how did you do this or that? And it's like, you know, this isn't, you know, we don't get this type of thing to, um, you know, happen or whatever. So it's like, it's like, yeah, and they're just like, yeah, Baltimore's in the building. <laughs> you know, when I'm in the building, and it's like, 
you know, I guess it's that hip hop thing of of, of uh, having your city on your back and like on you at all times. And you know, I kind of, I kind of, you know, rep DC a little bit too. Um, you know, I I was born there, and then you know, I spent many of my formative years there and everything too. So, you know, I got the whole DMV type of thing going on with it too, but. You know, you say Baltimore and people, they, you know, it's like that whole demeanor changes sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I, mean, I think if, um, I think if I was like within Oklahoma's, uh, hip hop scene, mm-hmm. I, I, then I think I would feel more of a, like, more of a sense of pride. But, um, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, cause I really, I, I'm to the point that, you know, I don't really think that what I'm doing is all that hip hop or even when it, whenever it comes out, I don't think it'll exactly be labeled as hip hop for real at this point. But, um, I think with, you know, with like the indie scene, you know, like, um, there are, like, you know, three pretty big acts in, like in the indie scene that are, like are really big that come from Baltimore. Um, and so maybe within, you know, um, within this scene of these, maybe, um, they're not really, they don't really see it as that, um, I guess musically, like, you know, how did I get here? But then there still is that, that shit, like a certain aura, though, that, you know, they're just amazed. Like, it's just, it's just some, it's a weird city on the side of the country that just does all this crazy shit. Yeah, I, I think some of it, too, might just be, be because you're black and from Baltimore. Well, yeah, I think that's, you know, so they, they just assume that I come from some crazy background. Yeah, and like um, I was about to say um, the whole thing um, but yeah, like you know, Baltimore does have like a you know a thriving indie scene, and you know, I mean, hip hop is always you know it's a dominant cultural force right now, but you know, we haven't really popped off like that hip hop wise. But when you look at other genres of music like the indie scene and even like R and B and gospel music and stuff like that. Um, usually labeled under hip hop. I mean, yeah, they um, yeah, they they are um, most definitely alternative hip hop. But I think the like, I mean, because like if if you go back like back on their their earlier recordings, it's pretty, it's, it's really like you know really sample based and it's more boom bappy. Mm-hmm. And then like when they first out like that, their um, black up when it came out, that was still kind of it was still like within the realm of hip hop. Even like certain things that Butterfly was saying, and then I think like their latest album, mm-hmm. uh, they kind of you know went away from hip hop to a certain extent. So you get kind of like bouncy type of beats, but then they still they like, have these certain songs that like really just they like really boom back. You like with the with the eight oh eight claps and stuff like that, but they just have like a lot of sense based and um a lot of sense sense in them. Yeah, like real airy type of pads and stuff like that. Yeah, um, and I, I don't know, I think with me, I don't know, I think like that, the element is start. I mean, you can, I mean, if you really pay attention, I mean, it's in there, but you really got like, you really have to see it. You know, there aren't too many people using wind drums and stuff like that and CR, CR 78s. Yeah. And, you know, I'm trying to do some glitch type of stuff, so that's why I'm a, I'm kind of afraid that I don't think that my my stuff will be really labeled as hip hop, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, do you want to be labeled as hip hop? I mean, yeah, I, I think for the sake of the culture, I do. But then there's another side that's like you know, that's like for real. I don't really think MF Doom is really labeled as hip hop, and this sounds kind of like weird to say. Mm-hmm. Like people, are, yeah, people say it's hip hop, but. There's like a whole different. Re- there's a whole other reason why people like him. It's not. Re- it's not all because of hip hop. There's like there are other things that he does. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he's created a character to where you don't have to be into hip hop to be in the MF Doom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. So it's like and there's like another side of me that's like, well, I don't know if I really want to be labeled as that because you know, especially like with EDM popping up and 
you know, people doing these things with sound, like weird sounds and they having voice change ups, you know, the the things I've been doing since I was like sixteen. <laughs> Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, it's a maybe I should try to rock, ride this wave and see where it can take me, and then go back to like you know hip hop or saying I'm hip hop or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe you could just give it, um, like give it your own name, like how a lot of these EDM dudes they come out and whatever they like, whatever music they make, they just call it a whole other genre. It seems like. <laughs> Well, actually, I do have a name, but I'm not sure if this you, if um someone's used it yet or not. What's that? Uh, glitch hop. Hmm. I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah, either glitch hop or um something about like mo- modular music, modular hop, or something like that. Although that, that, that sounds kind of horrible. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. Like um. Like with Fat Beats, if you send them like a demo, they want like a letter. And then if you don't put it in your letter, they want an additional sheet. This is like the only label that I've seen that they want this. An additional sheet telling more about yourself and your project. And so um, I, I kind of like, you know, I write like at least like two drafts, like every letter I, I put out. And so I, I did like the first draft earlier and... I, I I just say that, you know, the, I say, you know, like where the project came from, the name of it, you know, it's about, it's pretty much a day in my life. And then I say, well, it's a mixture of boom bap, boom bap, uh, I think I put like electronic and glitch or something like that. Because I think boom bap is kind of like a generalized term. And so like, it's to the point that boom bap to me doesn't exactly mean hip hop anymore at this point. More of, a, more of a sound that people did, they, that, that people now incorporate in their music, but it came from hip hop. Yeah, that's true. I mean, because like you know, boom bap. You know, a lot of that instrumental type stuff and trip hop type stuff and um, all of that, you know, could be considered boom bap, and even some jazz now can be considered boom bap. Yeah. And it takes you back to that sound. Um, something that we were going to talk about before that we didn't. Um, I don't know. Like I've been listening to um, ASAP Rocky's new album, and you know the sounds that are on it and everything like that. It doesn't really sound like your typical commercial album on a lot of tracks, and he he almost seems like he's he's almost kind of going into your type of realm a little bit um to me on certain tracks what do you think i mean yeah and it's just a, this is the thing like i've been getting kind of like i mean like frustrated i mean although i mean P, yeah people have been doing this right but it's it's, it's becoming more mainstream and so that's why like when Shabazz spouses came out I was happy, but then kind of mad at the same time because like, you know shit that I've been doing, but because you're some dude from the '90s who want to reinvent yourself and start doing it, you automatically have a platform to do it, and people are going to listen. I mean, yeah, yeah like, 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 honestly, uh, I kind of feel like how how Q-tip, because I, I feel like how Q-tip feels when it came to Kamal the Abstract because. He said he said it that the same person he sent it to L.A. Reid, he put out Andre 2000's "The Love Below" way before um, after, because he because uh, for whatever reason he didn't want to put out Kamal the Abstract. And it's the well, I mean, I as I can see, I mean, it's "Love Below" is different. It is. I mean, they have Hey Ya, but then we, we've had a, we had a we've had conversations about Hey Ya, and the damn song, the beat doesn't make any sense. Well, see, this is the thing. Um, the thing with, like, L.A. Reid didn't put out The Love Below. He put out Speaker Box The Love Below. And oh, yeah. so it had that Speaker Box anchor to it to where, you know, there were some things that were on that particular disc that, you know, were more commercially palatable to, I guess the general public, and then if you wanted to listen to the Love Below, you could listen to it. And it's funny now because people only talk about the Love Below, but Speaker Box has some great songs on it. And I actually bought that album, 
And I don't know if you remember, even though I bought it, it was months before I even popped the Love Below in. I didn't even pop the Love Below in until we were in New Jersey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and then I he was like, oh, damn, this shit is actually good. But I used to play the mess out of the speaker box side, especially that record. Um, I mean, I mean, it had some, you know, some great songs on it. But, you know, I think, you know, you had to have, especially during that time, you had to have that balance. And it's funny because I run into, um, I guess, non-hip-hop people, I guess more white people who you know, aren't really into hip-hop, and they always say that's their favorite hip-hop album or whatever. And mm-hmm. it's like... And, and, and they always talk about how great and amazing Andre 3000 is. And it's like, uh... There also was Speaker Box, and, um... Andre 3000 isn't really rapping on a lot of those songs, so, you know... You yeah, see, and, and, like... I had a conversation with, uh, I think, my brother about that, and then, you know, like... I, mean, I think it was the whole thing, like, with Kendrick mm-hmm. and, um, and you know, like, his album. And, you know, my, my brother, he's not he's not mad at Kendrick. He's just mad, like, you know, where hip-hop is going. It's just, like, you know, it's really losing its, I guess, its original form. And I say you can kind of blame Andre 3000 for that because people, they label him as this rapper, but he's really known for this love, this love below. And he only, and I, I clearly remember, I said he only raps on, like, maybe three of those songs. And if you really want to be, like, technical, the song that he really, really only raps on is the final one when he talks about, um, when he talks about Erica Badu doing his life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he really doesn't rap on that. And then, um, but, you know, this is, like, one of the great hip-hop records with no rapping on it. <laughs> yeah. But, um... But yeah, but I mean, but you know, it, it seems like I mean, just reading about um, Kamal the Abstract and Q-Tip and you know what he went through with it, I kind of, I kind of feel like that, you know, like um, you have you have like all these weird people, like you know, you have ASAP Rocky, he's becoming more psychedelic as we speak. Um, Shabazz Palace, they they came out, which I think is like um, that really kind of annoyed me. But I think the first one that kind of that really annoyed me was kind of was um was All the Future to a certain extent. And how that was kind of accepted. And here I am, I'm 16 in my room, and I'm doing the same. I'm doing the same shit. Like even like cassettes. I remember like people, you know, you would tell me like DJ Quick and his how he does, what he does with like you know he um records stuff on cassettes and stuff like that and whatever else he does with it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, although he's probably been doing that for like forever though. But I mean, still like cassette culture, how that's coming back. Um, Back in the day, like um, Dr. Dre, they said that he he recorded his digital to cassette and then back to digital, and that's part of how he gets his sound. Oh, to this day? I don't know if it's to this day, but I imagine so, because DJ Quick said he did it as recently as YG's album, because he mixed My Nigga. And, you know, it's funny how that song stands out. Um, I noticed it like like sonically that song stands out compared to the rest of the album, and then he even said, you know, you hear how, how that song sounds like a little bit bigger and everything, and it's like, you know, I put that on tape, and then I and then went back in the digital from the analog, and that's why that sounds like that. And I was like, oh damn, like. Yeah, I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if I mentioned this though, but um, did I, did I mention to you about? I think it's DJ Quick. He did the drums for in the club. I think it's him, right? Oh, damn. I didn't even know that. I, th- I think it is him. Um, although I'm basing this on Wikipedia. But I'm, I'm about to check. But, um, but you know what? Like, Dre, like, now, there's no way I can see him. But all right, I'm thinking about um, the song that he did for, like, the, for Eminem, his first um, relapse. Mm. The, um, what was it called? Like, We Made You? Yeah. Yeah, the first single off of it. Just thinking about that and, like, these other, like, Cat- like you know, Catalina from Raekwon's album. Mm-hmm. There is no... I just can't imagine it because, like, if he runs that stuff through cassette, how does he get, like, the tapers out? There's no tapers in there. Hello? They- Hello? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were breaking up a little bit. You were saying if he runs the cassette. Yeah, I mean, like, there's no tape hits in like any of these like these newer beats that we're hear- hearing from Catalina to you know we made you. Well, maybe I don't know. Maybe he's not using a cassette, but maybe he's using some type of tape, like some type of studio tape or something like that. Like I'm not gonna say ADAT because ADAT is tape, but it's still digital. But um, you know, some other type of special Dr. Dre tape that he's using. <laughs> And I was about to say, I said, I was going to say that maybe it's some type of weird Dr. Dre thing that he does. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, all right, in the club. Yeah, yeah. Like, we listen to, um, we listen to Chronic and Doggy Style. Like, them joints sound big and warm and just, like, Something about the sounds that he's using, it just it just sounds different from anything else I think that's been put out hip hop wise. Uh I mean, yeah, that's true. I mean but yeah, um and even dog food, because um he didn't produce on there but he mixed it. Uh that was his second uh, his his last album on Death Row, right? No, no, Dog Food was uh, DPG. Oh, yes, right, Dog, all right, yeah. Did he do anything on Warren G's album? Like, mixing? I don't know. That's a good question. Because um, Warren G's album sounded pretty pretty warm to me, although it still had, like, a... It still had the fit, like, a Warren G feel, though. To me, at least. Um, but yeah, but uh, Wikipedia says that DJ Quick did a, did did the percussion on in the club. Mm. Um, yeah, I found I, I think I meant to mention that to you a while back. I yeah, found DJ, I've never listened to a DJ Quick album, but whenever he pops up on some like production, I I usually like it because he did something on Talib Kweli's Quality that was dope with uh, Bilal. And mm-hmm. then he did, um, a lot of people hate this song, but I love it, uh, Justify My Thug on Black Album. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's just something, like, when you hear his his tracks, like, it just it, it just has that warm feeling that takes you back into that zone. I guess that, I don't know, I always just call it that Cali thing. And I don't know if it's, like, the actual beat or if it's the way it's mixed or some type of mixture of the two but um and it's crazy cause like I really need to listen to a DJ Quick album <laughs> yeah I think I listened to like Way Too Funky from like 92 for like a long long time ago I don't, I don't really remember it or like that but yeah he seems like an, an interesting dude though I mean apparently he's done something for Chingy's album too uh, his uh, first, first yeah, Jack Cut. Yeah, um, apparently some call some song called Bag Up. Have you ever uh, listened to Chingy's first album? Uh, I think I did once, and I was I it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't my choice to. <laughs> uh, I've I, I've never listened to that thing, but I can't front that that one song. I don't even remember the song. I I just remember give what you got for a pork chop. But I can't front. That was like slightly a guilty pleasure for me musically, because I guess I probably like the beat and the hook. I mean, I mean, I think Holiday Inn, Holiday Inn was his best song, and then after that, it was on um, the one with Tyrese. Oh, I don't even remember the song with Tyrese. I remember Holiday. Inn. I did like that song. I think that song came out around the time. This is going off on a whole nother tangent, but I think that song came out at the same time that Cassidy's first single came out, which was a song called Take It that was real dope, but it wasn't on the album. Like, it just didn't pop off. But I remember seeing the video because he was on, like, a bus or something like that. And he was, you know, I guess that was his first time trying to make a commercial record and people didn't like it, but I thought it was dope. Man, um, I think um, Cassidy was someone else that um, the fuck? Um, uh, I'm my bad. It is like this. 
this weird bug, and it's like fuzzy. That's moving around on my table. It's weird. That's one thing about Oklahoma. I will say that um, it's op- open my my uh, I, I just be, I see new insects every day I've, that I've never seen in Baltimore. <laughs> Like seriously, like it, there's some weird, sh- there's some weird shit around here. I don't know if it's because of like the red dirt or what. Um, I've never seen anything like this ever before. I've never seen a fuzzy insect like this. It's it's, like it looks like a, no, no. It's like a, I don't know. It's like it's like a circle, and it, but it looks like a flower, like a flower moving on my table. <laughs> um. But yeah, but Cassidy is like someone else that I wanted to talk to talk about because um I saw his uh interview on the Breakfast Club from way back when I guess it was and I was thinking about him like what he's done. And I think that he's one of those artists that had kind of like a like a like a perfect a perfectly good balance when it came to like commercial. You know, he had like that uh you know, his joint with R. Kelly and then he would go to a snack D V D. You know, being in the car throwing money up, saying he'll kill people. It was perfect. <laughs> um, but I think his his commercial songs they weren't really. I mean, well, I, I mean, I think well, Hotel was pretty bad though. But um, the one that he had with uh, with Mashonda, um, Swiss Beats' his, uh, ex-wife. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that was on Swiss Beats' album. That one. I thought, um, I, I thought it was on Cassidy's album. Maybe it was on both of them. If it's the song I'm thinking about. Like, come on, ma. It's your song, ma. Okay, nah. Nah. No, uh, nah. no, I'm talking about something different. Oh, know? well, I mean, that was a rather catchy song. Yeah, he made little catchy songs, but it's like, I think that was that, that, that era where Swiss Beats was like, Real hit or miss, and Swiss Beats did that whole album, and I don't think Swiss Beats was ready to do a whole album back then. I mean, like Cassidy wasn't DMX to where DMX could could rap on them whack ass beats, and you wouldn't even realize that the beat was so whack. But you know, Cassidy's voice is a little bit more laid back, so like the beat would just be so whack in your ear. It's like you just had to skip a lot of them songs. Mm. Like, and then his second joint, when he came out while I'm a hustler, I think that's when he got locked up for that murder shit for like a year. And then he came back and got in that car accident and almost died. And he came out with that other album, which was weird because he's talking about like all this weird Jesus shit. And then he has this one song about the whole situation. And then at the end, it was like he was kind of apologizing to the family. But then he was like, but you got to understand, if I'm in my situation, it was basically like not an apology at all. He was just basically saying like, yo, whatever happened had to happen because I had to look out for me. And it was just like, you know, he gets on the Breakfast Club and these interviews talking about all this, all this holy shit. And then on his album, he's passing guns around, and then he might be doing a holy song, but still talking about how he had to do what he had to do. And it was just weird. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was weird, man. Like, like I remember him spitting some freestyle where he was on, like, some gospel rap type stuff, and I can't front. He killed it. (laughs) Like... That was like like if, 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 like if Cassidy was a was a gospel rapper, he would be the best one. I mean, he still he still had gemstones though. He got a you know, and Lil Zane, like he's still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, fucking um, I don't know. Like now, you know, talking about Cassidy freestyles. I mean, I'm just thinking about that classic one on um, on that Philly joint. What was his name? Cosmic Kev. Yeah. Right. Arab. <laughs> yeah. Um, I haven't watched that in a while. I used to watch that at least once every month. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like, it's something, and no, it seems like no one cares about it. No one ever talks about it. I mean, I mean, I. Uh, 
was, I mean, that shit was classic. I mean, and, 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 and like, there's been times when I've forgotten about it, and you brought it back up to me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, um, and I mean, but then, like, and then if you like go into like, if you go, if you go into like the the AR ad uh, freestyle after Cassidy gets done. He's like, like, A.R. Abbey, he's not even even freestyling. He's just talking about his baby mother and his problems. But it just sounds good. Yeah, I and mean. And it's to it. Yeah, that one line, he said something about, I couldn't get new shoes for Easter. I couldn't get coochie from Nisha. I was like, oh, man. Like, I felt this pain right there. <laughs> yeah, man. Um. But you know, I mean, I, I think um, Gucci Mane's uh, Atrium freestyle. I, I, I just call it the uh, the Atrium freestyle at this point. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a classic too. Yeah, man. I just remember like laughing at that joint for hours and hours, and then my little homeboy, who's like real deep in the streets and all that, he was talking about like. He basically was like, you know, I understand what you mean and everything, but, you know, coming from my perspective, and he kind of broke it down. I was like, okay, you know, I feel what you're saying, but, you know, (laughs) we're talking about rap right now. And even though he was, you know, in the streets and everything like that, he still came up, I guess, kind of under us, you know, me and my crew and all that. So, I mean, he knew what was up. So, you know, he knew, but he was just like, look, man, this is what we doing, and this is what we fucking with, because, you know, we relate to it. I'm like, yeah, you know, I can respect that. But, um, I mean, yeah. Another classic one was, uh, remember when Gucci Man was on, um, was on, uh, I think you mentioned this too, uh, when he was on DJ Green Lantern's show on Sirius. Oh man, I, I vaguely remember that, but I don't think I put that in the blog though. When he was like, "Bars, we need bars, Gucci bars," and it's oh like, yeah, and it's like you know, you know he was amping it up. He was probably laughing deeply on the inside when Gucci was spitting his bars or whatever. And it was, I mean, it was almost like a like a setup. Like that shit wasn't fair. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but I think the one thing about Gucci Man is that you know when he freestyles, he pretty much like he actually freestyles compared to other people. Yeah. So I mean, I mean his shit like I mean yeah I mean his his uh, his shook ones freestyle wasn't all that bad. I mean you know there's you know I mean it's all about evolution uh, evolution and I will say that he's one of the few artists of these trap artists who have you know they've actually evolved mm-hmm. um and then you know like I guess uh speaking of that you know like UCJ yeah and you know his his crazy ascendance into into relevancy again um and you know, I, I uh, I've been like you know, kind of studying him and all this all this other type of stuff, going back into um, the mixtapes that he had with Lex Luthor, Lex Luger, mm-hmm. that kind of made him more relevant. And although I mean, those made they really weren't good, but you know, you go from that to his album State Trippy and um, and uh, Blue Dream and Lean Two, which had some pretty good songs on there. But um, the main thing about Juicy J is that his lyrics just got, like, way better. You know, he's actually, like, you know, doing... He has, like, these different flows that he uses and, and uh, you know, different punchlines and stuff like that. And I'm not a big track... But actually, I was curious to know, would you call what he does trap music or would you call it EDM? Is he J? Yeah. Um, I mean, I really think it depends on what type of beat he's on. Like, you know, he's messing... I mean, I wouldn't say anything that he does is really, like, EDM-ish, but, like, when he's on them Lex Luger, Lex Luger beats, I think he's definitely trapped. Um, when he's on other type of beats, I think it's just more Dirty South hip-hop type stuff. But, like... So what about make a dance? Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, and when he's on like, well, I, yeah, yeah, I'm, I would say that's track, but it's, um, it's a little bit softer. 
but it still got that trap feel. Okay, but um, you know, I like, thinking about Juicy, you know, I think like like hip hop, it's to a point now that um, since it's older, that you know, we really a lot of like the like the new things that are coming out. It seems they're they're like it's pretty much older rappers who are reinvent, reinventing themselves, kind of sorta. So you know, even like on, on the underground, on in the underground, we have um, you know, you have. Um, I guess Raekwon, you can say he did it with Cuban Links 2. Um, we have MF Doom, who came up, you know, through KMD. And we have, uh, Shabazz Palaces and stuff like that. And then the mainstream, you have Juicy J. Uh, well, I really, uh, I guess, I guess it's really kind of his only Juicy J. I mean, maybe you can kind of like say, you can, you can say Lil Wayne to a certain extent, I guess. I mean, you could say Wayne, you could say even Nas. Like, he reinvented himself on Life is Good. I mean, do you really think he reinvented... I think he re- I think he reinvented himself through uh, Hip Hop is Dead. It seemed like he became like, just way more relevant than what he was before. I mean, I think a lot of that had to do with, like, marketing. But, like, I think in terms of of songs... Like, I think I think Life is Good had different type of songs than what he normally was putting on those other albums, and different type of like production was similar, but it was it was like more solid and, and together. If that makes any sense? Yeah. Like, but I think he's done it before because he kind of reinvented himself on uh, on Stillmatic. I mean, yeah, I mean, well, shit, people say that that just made not as relevant, period, overall. So what is the day? Yeah, I mean, really, it did, because, I mean, you know, he was kind of done. I mean, but that Stomatic came out, and, you know, I mean, he had the ether on there, but he had that song, What Goes Around, which today is still, like, one of my favorite hip-hop songs ever. Um hmm. He had, um, even his singles from there, like, they weren't your regular singles. Like, he had one mic, um, so I know you don't like that song, but, um, and then he, he, he had, um, fucking, the, uh, the bridge is over. Like, that shit was just so angry, but it was funny at the same time. Mm-hmm. But that was around at the time, and I've been thinking about doing a post for the blog of like the most, like like some of the craziest rap uh, radio interviews. Yeah. And like and like every once in a while, I gotta go back to his interview when he was on Power 105, and he just was going at Hot 97 because they um, took him off Summer Jam because of what he wanted to do, and he just started going off on everybody, and like you know he went off on Nori. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> like, like, it was just so random. Like, he was like, and Nori, you my man, but you, your album is whack. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the times his mother died, right? Yeah. I mean, but it's funny, though, because everyone, yeah, because everyone pretty much, like, they, did, they didn't pay attention to what every daughter should do was saying. I mean, yeah, I mean, that shit was epic. Like, I just go back to that sometimes. I'm like, wow, like. No, it's really had some anger in him right there, and it's funny because he's so laid back all the time. But he he was hot right there. Well, maybe he was like super high or something. I don't know. I just think but, um, up because they wouldn't let uh, Hot ninety seven wouldn't let them do like a um or let him do like a fake lynching of uh, Jay Z on the stage, and he was like, you know, in retrospect, that was probably a bad idea that he came up with. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I don't know about that. I mean, it, I mean, you know, hip hop is all is all metaphors and stuff like that. So I mean, it's, I think it's more metaphorical than anything. Yeah, I mean, but I don't know. Like the way Jay Z did his thing, like on Summer Jam, it was kind of funny and clever and stuff like that. And Nas, you can <laughs> tell he was consumed by anger, like. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can imagine. Come to think about it now, like, like just kind of like picturing it. 
like, like you know, Jay Z makes people laugh. Nas just would have just had people like, yo, what the fuck, like, <laughs> like, like this is crazy. And you know, one of the debates I've had with people is that, um, you know, Takeover versus Ether. Um, um, people were saying that, you know, Nas, he doesn't really have any humor to him. He just sounds so angry and mad. But Jay Z on on Takeover, he's just kind of like laughing and. You know, just having a good time over the beat and saying little funny things, but you could tell Nas is just like, "You a dick rotten faggot. You love the attention." Like, <laughs> I mean, but then, but see, this is the thing about like the, 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 that battle is that you really have to put it in perspective. And the main thing that Nas is he he always said is that he was away for well, he was away because his mother his, his mother was sick. And then his, he's dealing with his mother pretty much dying. Yeah. And he had to hear the shit about that Jay-Z was saying. So, of course, you know, because he, he had no intention of even making an album no time soon, but that, that forced him into doing it. Yeah. Which overall, it helped him, but, you know, he had he had some shit going on with him. The same thing with Cameron. That's why, you know, when Cameron disappeared and he just reappeared again, he said his mother was sick. And, um, you know, the funny thing is, that, you know, a lot of people forget is that the beef was really Nas and Memphis Bleak. Yeah. Like, they were throwing shots back and forth, and then Jay-Z is the one who stepped in, like, you know, let me do this, because I guess, you know, he had some 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 prior grudges against Nas from back in the day or whatever, because um, Nas was supposed to be on reasonable doubt, but didn't show up to the session or whatever. And then, you know, they had women in common, <laughs> get it more in common. Which I, was, I mean, that was a real stretch bar right there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess it just goes to show. I mean, well, it's funny. I think if, if Memphis Bleak had a, uh, I don't know, some type of beef with like a, a larger rapper now, I wonder if Jay Z would uh, would step in to do anything. I don't think so. I mean, the last person Jay Z really came. Oh, I don't know. Blueprint Three. Like, I don't know if you remember Blueprint Three, but that was just like a real bitter type of album to me. Like, it was just subliminal shots on every song. Like talking about like you know Beanie Siegel and State Property and just all the old people from the Rock. Like, he just seemed real pissed the fuck off. I mean, I, I don't understand why he he's all that pissed off though. I mean, like, um, and actually, you know, when um, um I, I looked at the Breakfast Club interview with him when he told when he mentioned that he told people that Fifty Cent was coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it was like 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 seeing like seeing him when he was like his face when he was saying it. It seems like he's still shot to this day. <laughs> Like the way it happened, like his eyes gotta be when he said, "I told him, Fifty Cent is coming." <laughs> <laughs> and that's thing I know. Three months later, and the club comes up, and none of they didn't have nothing. <laughs> you know what? So I, I remember. I- I remember seeing that, and I was so surprised that he actually admitted that, like, because I can just, because I was just picturing him just like, yo, 50 Cent is coming, like, he got June with him, like, yo, he coming, like, you got to get your shit together, get ready, he's coming, and it's funny because around the same time, I don't know, if it might have even been before, 50 said, like, the reason why Jay-Z is so successful is because he can see shit, so, like, when 50 came... That's when Jay Z retired and became president of Def Jam, and then when Fifty started dying down, that's when Jay came back. I mean, yeah, see that, man, that was, man, when, that, when he was, when he retired, man, we never believed that shit. We were just waiting for this, uh, this another, uh, this other album to come. Anyway, I, I mean, Fifty Cent was coming, so. <laughs> <laughs> and home, so one way, so all right, so. Hey, this nigga 50 Cent is coming, and then years later he comes out with Kingdom Come. Mm. Mm. I wonder if there's, any, if there's any some type of subliminal shit to that. 
But then, I mean, what was it? Back in 98, 99, Jay-Z threw a shot at 50. Yeah. And he said, um, you know, I'm about a dollar. What the fuck is 50 cent? Like, you know, that's so much jam, right? I think he first did it at Summer Jam, but that was on Volume 3 on that joint that Timbaland produced. I forget the name. Uh, when it's hot, it's hot, I believe. It might not be that song, but, um, like, he saw 50 Cent coming years before. <laughs> yeah, it still didn't, still didn't work out in his favor, but, um, you know, like, the thing about Rockefeller, I think, and it may, this may sound kind of weird, but um, I think it didn't help them having the um the in-house producing powerhouse that was that that is just Blaze. Mm. I think that sometimes it may have made them a bit lazy that they have the studio where they just have this this powerhouse that's just there making these beats. So I think sometimes it may well Seagull I think is a bit different. Um, you know, she just had other things going on, of course, but the free, you know, you had Freeway, I mean, Bleak. Bleak should have been, Bleak, Bleak should, should have still been around today, because if you think about it, like, what's going on now, and, like, the, these track EDM-ish type beats, he can rap on them, if he really wanted to, I mean, he does, but he's just not relevant, and I think that, at that time, he would have been able to carve out like a little a little niche for him, niche a little niche for him at that time messing with Just Blaze. I think he tried to, but I think Dear Summer fucked that up. No, I mean well I mean but we saw like way like way before Dear Summer like made and even um even uh, his first album. I mean, cause, um, I was looking at him and supposedly his first album went gold. I don't see how, but his it went first gold. Album went gold. Hey, I mean, I mean, the third one went gold, too, supposedly. But, I mean, yo, he had hits. Like, he has a catalog. Well, this, this is what I'm saying, though, but... But but then, like, I mean, I think the main thing I'm saying is that why didn't one of these albums go platinum? I think it, they could have been if he would have, you know... Yeah, probably not just... Because, like, it seems like, all right, it seems like when he came out with the album... He would, then he would, but he would come out with an album, and then around the same time, Jay Z probably had an album out that he was still working on, like he was still like working, promoting, or he was about to drop one. Then he would, he would, he would hurry up and go on tour with Jay Z, but then he would be his hype man, or whatever like that, or perform under Jay Z, and not, you know, do his own tour. And I think that's, what, I think that's what one of the best things Wiz Khalifa did when Drake came to him. You know, you know how Drake does when he yeah. when he sees someone's coming up, he's like, oh, come on my tour with me. But he didn't yep. do that. He said, no, I'm going to make my own tour for myself. Yep. J. Cole did the same thing. Well, but, you know, it's interesting that we say this, right? And then, it, but ASAP Rocky went on tour with Drake. And ASAP Rocky is ASAP Rocky. I mean, I guess it's all how you use it and do everything. Like, ASAP <clears throat> Rocky is ASAP Rocky, but ASAP Rocky had a lot of, like, he had his own support. Like, like, look at J. Cole, you just have J. Cole. Mm-hmm. So, J. Cole can't be doing shit like that. A$AP Rocky got, like, a whole team behind him. So, even if he does go on, on um, tour with a bigger artist, he still looks like a boss because he got dudes under him. Same thing with yeah. um, even Kendrick Lamar when he went out with Kanye. Um, like, you know, he, he has that TDE whole thing behind him. But, like, you look at, like, a Wiz Khalifa, you just got Wiz Khalifa. You look at J. Cole, you just got J. Cole. And it's like, you know, especially around that time. And then, you know, the whole whole stereotype for J. Cole, like, (laughs) how, like, people talk about, you know, why don't J. Cole have any pictures with Jay-Z or anything like that? Like, you know, does Jay-Z even know who J. Cole is? I mean, it's a good question. I mean, even, like, in the Breakfast Club interview, they were asking him about J. Cole, and he just really said, oh, yeah, that's my man. And he couldn't really say anything else about it. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, J. apparently Cole he can knows. text him, though. Hmm? I mean, apparently he, J. Cole can text him. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, 
I think the appealing thing about Cole is, you know, he's kind of self-sufficient. So it's just like, you know, you tell us what you want to do, and we'll just put the shit out, put a little muscle behind it, and, you know, just go. But Jay-Z did say that, you know, his whole thing is building legacy artists and artists who are going to be able to, you know, live forever off their music. So, you know, even though the first couple of albums might not be that big, it's a growing process. And you see that now where J. Cole, his first album, you know, was kind of whack didn't do great but now he can just announce that he's dropping an album in a week or two and that shit outsells everything with nothing no radio single no even leak single or nothing he just put the shit out and the shit just went I mean yeah I guess that's what he's trying I mean but I mean it, I, I guess it comes to a point that when you really establish yourself when you're like a label just like an entity overall that you know, you you try to have a balance between critically acclaimed people and people who just, like, really sell records. And so I guess you can see Jay-Z kind of doing that with Jay Electronica. Because I'm pretty sure that he doesn't really think that he's going to sell a whole bunch of, like, records like that anyway. I mean, I don't know. I mean, years ago, who, I mean, I mean, you wouldn't think J. Cole would sell a lot of records. Well, the, well remember, I mean... Sells- I mean, like, 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 J. Cole outsells everybody except Drake. Well, I mean, but yeah, but, but remember what I said about J. Cole way, way back when around the come up? I said that J. Cole, he's going to come out, and every album he comes out with is going to go gold. <laughs> and then, then that's what's good, that's what's happening. But Kendrick Lamar, I never expected him to, to go platinum. Oh, man, you know what's funny? I was telling you about that post earlier. I don't think we talked about it on the podcast, but before the podcast, um, we are talking about worst songs from albums. One yeah. of those songs was uh, Michael Jordan from um, from that mixtape that came out before uh, Section 80. What was that shit called? Um, uh, Overly Dedicated, OD. Remember that song, Michael Jordan? And, and, and like, that was the first thing from Kendrick Lamar we both heard. And we yeah, watched that video. Yeah, but he was still K-Dot then, though. Nah, nah, nah he was Kendrick Lamar then. Cause that was that was after the Kendrick Lamar EP. Oh, okay. All right, because I, rem- I remember, like, I remember you were explaining to me, like, you know, oh, this that nigga K-Dot. And I'm like, who the fuck is K-Dot? He's like, this nigga Kendrick Lamar. He was K-Dot that way back when. I'm like, oh. All right, yeah, and I was like, man, and, like, you know, we were like, you know, let's listen to this shit. And we listen to that shit, and we just bust out laughing. Yeah, I remember. Uh, and then that's when you know, we came up with... Uh, no, I mean, no, because then Overly Dedicated caught some traction, and then we were like, oh, okay, and then Section 80 came out. Yeah, because we watched that video, that um, the one that, you know, supposedly made Dr. Dre sign him. Um, I can't think of the name of it, um, but basically it was like this whole, the, like the video was like this whole drive-by shit, or like, not even drive-by, it was like a walk-up, remember that? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I don't know, I like... I, I like artists that that I don't like at first, but over time they make me like them. So like at first with J Cole, I thought I was like, "What the fuck?" But you know, I'm like I mess with Cole now. Kendrick at first I was like, "What the fuck is this shit?" But I mess with him now. Um, I'm trying to think who Ma- else is like that. Uh, Max B, right? Y'all like that too, right? Oh yeah, definitely Max B. I couldn't stand Max B. Um, but see, you know. <laughs> No, it's funny, man. Like, um, like, I, I like, I, because to this day, I don't really understand why I like Max B, but it's just between you, like, the way you, you played that man on the way to Silver Spring, like, and, it, but it's funny, like, like, like the song that, that made me start liking him was the, the Bigger Made Me Come joint, and I thought he said, shit on my lap. <laughs> but it just sounded so smooth, though. I think the song that made me like Max B was um, when he went over the Chris Brown Kiss Kiss joint. Yeah. And, like, I really liked the Chris Brown song, but then when I heard Max, I was like, oh, shit, like, this is crazy. You know, I think there are only two artists that can really, like, like really totally, like, flip um, songs and, and make, them, make them their own, and that's Styles P and, um, and Max B. I thought you were going to say 50. 
I think fifty. I think fifty is like kind of like an anomaly and a bit different when it comes to like how he does things. But I think what like the way I mean is that um they don't really follow the the structure of the song. They just told they just oh. take it, and yeah. for some reason that aura just overpowers the beat, and then you just forget that there was another person that actually had this song before they even did it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like, like, Max, although Max D followed the structure of the uh, the Britney Spears joint, give me whatever that. See, I don't even, I don't even know the the name of the original song, but give me Slugs. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, um, to this day, like Styles P, when he he um he rapped over the uh, the little the little Bow Wow and Sierra joint from back yeah. in the day, and he was talking about killing people, like killing all these people. He, I think he killed like five people in his one song, but <laughs> the beat. Just reflected like like the night. It sounded like he was like the night, and he was killing all these people. <laughs> Man, I've been trying to keep up. Styles P, he's been dropping like hella joints. Usually on a Friday, he'll drop like two new songs, and I just haven't had a chance to really check him like that. But you know, like Fabulous has been doing the same thing. I'm looking forward to his new DJ Clue mixtape. Um, and, you know, the little bits and pieces of Summer Jam that I could catch, it made me think about Fabulous. And he's really up there in the upper echelon of uh, of hip-hop. And then, like, he, he opened it up with that song that he did, um, uh, Lituation. And, like, you know, the song was cool to me, but watching him perform, I was like, yo, this song is real hard. And then I mean, so... <laughs> oh, go ahead. Just his, I mean, he was able to bring out everybody classic. And then when you think about his catalog, yo, his catalog is deep. Like, Fabulous could do a B-Sides concert, maybe even as good or as, as, you know, better than Jay-Z. And he was like the next dude out of Brooklyn who was going to be the next Jay-Z. And, you know... A lot of people would say that that 9/11 is what really fucked them up because the album came out on the same day the towers dropped. That was when they had Breeze on it, right? Mm mm. His um, his very first album with um, no. Nate Dogg and all that. Hell no, man. No, I mean, I I really feel like Fabulous was defined on the second one that had Breeze on it. Because you got to see, because he, he really started getting, was, like... That wasn't until huh? his, like, third or fourth album. Well, I mean, like, like I mean, the only thing I... The only thing... Well, it, I feel like Fag was, like, kind of had, like, a, like lost years, like, Jesus, because I remember his first appearance, or, like, at least commercial um, appearance on Bill Moe's Superman, Super, uh, Superwoman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you said that you hate Fag, but you can't stand him. And then next thing I know, he comes out with Breathe. And then we had people like RZA saying that one of the beats that he wished he made other than Jesus Walsh was Breathe. I mean, that's one of the best beats ever. Oh, man. <laughs> I wouldn't say all that. I mean, I, I think Come On Baby was better than, than that beat. Uh, just blaze wise at least. Come On Baby? With Saigon? Yeah. That beat sounds like a Swiss beat to me. Oh, I mean, that Swiss beat made that. He made that beat. No, nah, he wasn't. No, nah, but he was on the hook. Just Blaze made the beat, but to me, it just sounds like a Swiss beat. Man, I don't know. Swiss, I don't think Swiss beats can, can get can get down like that. On, like samples, like chopping something like that up to this day. Nah, nah, nah. Like some of Just Blaze's best work, I think, is on Kingdom Come. Them first three tracks. Like, show me what you got. A lot of people hate on that song, but yo, that beat is amazing to me. And then, um, and I know other people used the same sample before, but it just sounded so lush when Just Blaze did it. And then the other song that he did, um, I think it's track two on Kingdom Come. Um, you are not, uh, like, I'm trying to think. I don't even remember how it goes. I just know the beat is just so crazy. Like, you can just listen to the beat without Jay-Z on it, and it's good. And really, 
you know, I could tell it was a hard record to mix because it was so much high in it. Like, you can't even really hear Jay-Z's voice like that. But that shit was so hard. But, I mean, you know, played. Yeah, so uh, much shit. You know, if I recall, I would say that I think um, Kingdom Come was probably one of Jay-Z's most uh, weirdly mixed albums based on like, the different producers that he had. Because then, you know, he also had that, the, the, uh, the Dre record, which sounded more fuller than anything else, can, you know, in the, uh, on the album for real. I think he had, th- he had like two or three Dre records. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't, that, well, it's been almost 10 years, right? I was I listened to the album like 10, 9 years. That one was not that old. Oh my goodness, it was that old. Oh shit. Well, it was like, what, 2007, man, 2008. No, the hell no, not for me because I, I was I wasn't in college. So like two thousand six, two thousand seven. Because the black album was two thousand three, right? Two thousand two. Two thousand three, I believe. So well, so the black album came out the same time Give Richard Got Trying came out. Was it? Hold on, did it? That's crazy. Cause that was his last album, yep. Yeah. Yeah, because he knew 50 was coming, so that's when he put out his last album and just chilled until 50 died down. That's when he came back. Damn, that's crazy. And it's funny because 50, you know, he'll, he'll point that shit out because <laughs> he just don't give a fuck. So like, but the thing is, though, if Jay Z, if he, if he, if Jay Z stuck around, would he? I mean, would, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Jay Z would have held his ground. I don't know, yo. Feeling this here. Yeah, son, you can feel it, man. Roll up, son. You gotta just do it, yo. Yo, roll up, man. It's a different channel, son. Roll up, on, man. Roll up, watch the channel, son. Different plane now, man. It's all good. Roll up, all good, baby, in every hood, son. Roll up, yo. CNN, Network Channel 10. It's on again. Street niggas, it's grown men. Bold face, got in your face. Stay in place, yo. Crime lace. Cast more beef than Scarface. CNN, Network Channel 10. 